Revelation chapter 10, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, rainbows upon his head, his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, because it was closed at one time, it was in God's right hand, now it's in Christ's right hand, and set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. And verse 3, we touched on that uh, last Sunday, and I'm going to pick it up there and move on. He cried with a loud voice as when a lion roared. And when he had cried, like seven thunders uttered their voices. Don't you think about that? And what possibility, what do you think those seven thunders might have been? I'm going to ask you that when we get to it. Let's go back there to the beginning of the verse. He cried with a loud voice when the lion roared. There's actually, I, I don't, I'm pretty sure we didn't get this last Sunday. I may be wrong. But I was looking over my notes again. And uh, I don't remember touching on this. But let me read. If you want to turn in Proverbs chapter 19, Proverbs 19, 20, 28, 30. We're all in the same area here in Proverbs. So it won't, won't hurt you too bad to there the Proverbs there. Uh, speaking of hurting too bad, uh, Mike is off. You'll have to holler at me. If this was on, what happened here? Yeah, sometimes you'll have to holler at me, JR, and get my attention. Or throw stuff out the window. There we go. Um... But anyway, um, oh, I was going to tell you, I, I mentioned the other day that uh, they did an MRI of Lisa. She went to see uh, what I thought she was, I thought she was going to see the um, orthopedic surgeon. She saw a nurse practitioner. The nurse practitioner said that it'll heal by itself. Um, it's not healing by itself. It's getting, uh, in my opinion, it's getting a little worse. And um, she switches back and forth from using the sling to not using the sling, but it, when she doesn't use the sling, she pays the price later. And uh, so anyway, we're contemplating a second opinion. And uh, so just pray for her in that situation. And um, she may have to have surgery yet. In, in my opinion, um, I, it doesn't seem to me that it's healing. It's been over a month, and um, it, it's just not getting any better. So uh, if you would pray for her, pray for everyone else that's got aches and pains. We've got storms coming tomorrow, I think. But anyway, in Proverbs, uh, uh, Solomon wrote of, of the lion in about four places, I found. In Proverbs chapter 19, if you look there, boy, I tell you what, this powerful stuff. And just one verse is power enough. Proverbs chapter 19, if you look in verse 12, the king's wrath, and I want you to think of the king as, as being maybe Christ, or it could be just an earthly king. Could be that. Uh, back in the day when kings actually had authority and power um, right now what we have in this world we have kings we have King Charles in England but his is a title role uh, he has very very little power and authority um, but the British love their monarchs and uh, I say God save the king and God save the queen or whoever it is uh, let me just throw this at you real quick. Uh, a lot of people say that they like the King James because it doesn't have a copyright. That's partially true. Um, however, when King James of England commissioned in 1604 at the Hampton Court um, to have the Bible translated using Church of England scholars, Puritan scholars, and, and some others... He wanted a Bible 
that could be for all the people of England, not just the Church of England, not just one group. He wanted a Bible that all could agree upon. And so, 1611, they delivered to him this book that we have in our hands. It has come to us uh, unchanged since 1611. Uh, the only changes that have been made is the changes in spelling and correction of printing errors that have crept in over the years. But anyway, um, oh, when King James received this Bible, it's referred to as the, author, the King James Bible or the authorized Bible because it is authorized to be read in all the churches. It, they used to have that in the title page. Um, here in mine it says containing the Old and New Testaments translated out of the original tongues with former translations diligently compared and revised by His Majesty's special command. When King James received this, he put it under what's called a royal letters patent. And the word patent is important. So essentially he did copyright or patent the words of this Bible, meaning that they cannot be changed without uh, authority from whoever, not, not King James, whoever sits on the throne. It's under the, it's under the monarchy, not just under King James. So after King James died, his successor had authority um, over whether the Bible would remain the same or whether it would be changed and so on. I believe it was uh, King George of England that uh, in the mid-1800s wanted to revise uh, some of the wording that was in, the, that was in uh, the authorized Bible, take out the these and thous and so on, and he gave it to uh, two men, Westcott and Hort, who went way far afield of what the king wanted, and they actually came up with a whole different translation, and it's called the Revised uh, standard version and uh, so the King James Bible remained intact it was never changed and so what that means is as long as there is a monarch as long as there is a king or a queen sitting on the throne in England the words of this Bible in the United Kingdom will be protected forever for as long as there's a king or queen in England nobody can change this Bible and uh, I was talking to a man one time from uh, Nottingham, England. He, he would call and we'd talk for a while. He was uh, sharing some of my uh, teachings on the Bible and so on. And that's kind of what he did. He was an old retired man. And I loved talking to him. Hello, Mike. This is Barry from England. You could leave the from England off. I get it. Uh, but anyway, he told me, he said, Mike, he said, what happened was, he said, the sodomite crowd in England tried to get Cambridge and Oxford, the two universities that hold the patent to the King's Bible. And in the United Kingdom, you need permission from either Cambridge or Oxford to republish uh, verses or the whole Bible yourself. You need permission from them to, in order to do it. Certainly you can't alter the text and refer to it as the authorized Bible. So anyway, they sued Cambridge and Oxford because they said the word sodomite in the Bible made them look bad. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure your gay pride parade did that. Okay, That's what makes you look bad. The court reached a verdict that said that the court nor the people of England have any right to alter the words of the authorized Bible. The court can't make them do it. Not even Cambridge and Oxford can alter the words that are in the authorized Bible. Only the king or only the queen, whoever's sitting on the throne, only they have the authority to have the words changed in the authorized Bible. And so far, they haven't changed it. And I believe that that is by uh, the direct hand of God.
preserving his word by the authority of a king. When it says here in Proverbs 19, 12 again, the king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion. He means just that. Uh, in the case of Christ, now this is Christ, and he's roaring like a lion. So what is he doing? He is, I believe, he's announcing his coming wrath. Um, go back to Revelation 10. I have something. Um... Yeah. There was, let's see here. I'm thinking maybe chapter 11. No, it's it's back. I'm thinking of Revelation chapter 6. That's what I'm thinking of. In Revelation chapter 6 verse 16, they said to the mountains and rocks, "Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of who? The lamb. Look at that. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So when I see Proverbs 19, when I see Revelation 10, and this, this angel who bears all the marks of being Jesus Christ, uh, when he roars as, a, as when a lion roareth, and then I see here that the king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion, it says to me that this angel, if it is Christ, is roaring to announce that his wrath is soon to come. Because later on in Revelation 10, we're going to find out that the mystery of God is complete. Meaning, and I'll show you what all that means as we get to it. But once the mystery of God is complete and it's over, then the seventh trumpet sounds. And after that trumpet, you have the seventh, the seventh trumpet brings in the vials of wrath. Okay? So we have pending right now the wrath of the king and he is announcing it as the roaring of a lion but his favor is as dew upon the grass now I like this and I'll tell you why in the book of Deuteronomy Moses is is telling us uh, God is telling us through Moses God says my doctrine shall distill as the dew and as the gentle rain. So think about that. Where does dew and rain come from? It comes from above. It comes from heaven. And that's how God waters the earth. Uh, when you need rain. And what you get is a torrential rainstorm. That doesn't help anything. Because basically it's going to do more harm than good. What you need is a good, soft, steady long-term series of rains to come down upon your crops or whatever it is uh, to water them gently so that they can have time to draw in the water and grow thereby and God's doctrine to us comes to us exactly that way the day you got saved God did not immediately pour out unto you everything that you need to know about being a Christian he gives it slowly over time. We're all learning. I'm still learning. There are still things that I have questions about, things that I don't know, things I'm not sure of, things I haven't discovered yet. I have questions that I haven't even asked yet because I don't know what they are. You see what I'm saying? But I read the scriptures, then it brings a question to my mind. What does this mean? Or how does this work? Or what is this related to? And I'm just telling you, that's how the Bible works. So while his wrath is as the roaring of a lion, his favor to those uh, who are righteous and those that belong to him is as the dew upon the grass. It comes every morning, the grass draws it in, uses it to grow thereby, and strengthen itself. Um, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 2, look at that. If you hear water running in there that's on purpose the reason why it's on purpose is because I almost broke my neck 
running up these steps to turn the baptistry water off before it ran over the side years ago. I did. I tripped on the top step and scooted across the stage on this knee, ripped a hole in my pants, put a big bloody sore on my knee, tore my back up, and I was trying to get to the baptistry because I forgot about it. And so a few years ago, Brother Sterling installed a, um, a float. So there's a float in there, and when it reaches a certain level, water shuts off. Phew. Thank God. So anyway, no more running up on the stage. Uh, Proverbs 20, verse 2. The fear of a king, oh, look at this, is as the roaring of a lion. Wow. Who's, listen to this now. Whoso provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own soul. We have seen in the last 10 to 20 years uh, the wickedness in America grow popping up like mushrooms after a rain. And they just all of a sudden, boom, there they are. They started having these Antifa protests, BLM protests, um, and all kinds of anti-government, uh, anti, uh, huh? anti-police, anti-authority, uh, protests everywhere, and anti-Christian protests. Because a lot of these, a lot of these people, especially these gals, were wearing T-shirts that were like "Satan is my savior," stuff like that. Uh, just absolutely spitting in the eye of Almighty God. Some people have it in their mind that they don't believe in a God, but if there is a God and I stand before Him, I'm going to spit in His eye. They have so much hatred in them. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure when you stand before God, you're going to melt. Right where you are, you're going to melt. You're going to be shaking violently because you know that God's wrath is about to be laid upon you. And that wrath is going to last for eternity. Imagine, if you will, just briefly, the screams of someone inside of an automobile and the automobile is on fire and it's burning them up and there's no way to rescue them and there's no escape out of the car. Imagine the screams of someone desperately trying to get out of that car being on fire they are burning up in the process and they are screaming hysterically. Uh, I unfortunately have listened to some of the recordings of the Apollo 1 astronauts when they were doing a series of tests inside the capsule. They were in full um, spacesuits, helmets on. For some reason, they locked the door to the uh, capsule they were in there and they were running pure oxygen into that capsule all it took was one spark and within about a minute and a half it was all over and they have the recordings of those astronauts screaming to um, whoever they were talking to on the other end, we're on fire, open this door, open this door. And they couldn't open the door because the fire had created a suction against the door. They couldn't get it open. And they're screaming in there that they're on fire. And of course, all three of those men burn up in that fire. Horrible way to die. It's an even worse way to spend eternity. Every now and then it does us good to get a little dose of hell. And remind us that God's wrath is true. And God's wrath is real. The fear of a king is as the roaring of a lion. Whoso provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own soul. Why would you want to provoke God?
Why would you want to? Sodom did it. Look what happened. Gomorrah did it. Look what happened. Um, people have done it. Kingdoms have done it. Whole nations have done it. Individuals have done it. Groups have done it. Families have done it. They provoke God to anger at the expense of God's wrath being poured out upon them. Proverbs 28. Turn there. Boy, this is true right here. The wicked flee, verse 1. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. Okay? That's somebody that's committed a crime. And they think they got away with it. But they spend the rest of their life looking over their shoulders. And they run and hide. But nobody's chasing them. So what's making them flee? Their conscience. The Bible says that your conscience testifies against you it witnesses against you so on judgment day if you're lost you can expect your conscience to show up to be called on the witness stand because your conscience is going to tell the truth of what you did which is why people when they lie a lot of times you can detect people lying you say look me in the eye and say that look me right in the eye and say that and it's because we know to watch the eyes, to watch facial expressions, especially of, of children. Okay? Can you tell when your children are lying? Yep, just about every time. The wicked flee when none pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And who's the righteous? Jesus Christ, the righteous, the Bible says. The righteous are as bold as a lion. It, it's, it's a plural there. Righteous are instead of righteous is. Righteous is would be singular. The righteous are would be Christ and his people are bold as a lion. Um, and then one more in Proverbs chapter 30. Look at verse 29. Proverbs chapter 30. Verse 29 and 30. Uh, the Bible says, There be three things which go well, yea, four are comely in going. A lion, look at this, which is strongest among beasts, uh, and turneth not away for any. Turneth not away for any. In other words, they are not scared. They're not scared. Uh, I've seen lions try to chase down small elephants. Lions try to bring down a tall giraffe. And the kick, one kick from a giraffe can kill a lion. Okay, that's how strong their kick is. Uh, and I've seen that happen before. Um, but anyway, they, I've seen them go after uh, water buffaloes crocodiles, leopards, other lions. Boy, to watch two male lions fight, you, you're glad that you're not in the middle of it. Trying to get them to calm down. Now settle down, boys. We can work this out. Rawr! Hey, I'm going to tell, tell you how strong the wrath of a male lion is. Let's say you've got a, a male lion and he is... The king over his den. He's got, let's say he's got four lionesses. And, and out of those lionesses, let's say there's a dozen cubs. If, uh, if another male lion comes to challenge his kingship over that den. And succeeds in killing the lion who is over that den. Once he kills the male lion... He immediately assumes command over those four lionesses. They instantly turn to him. And that male lion then who challenged and won will take every one of those cubs and kill them. Because he's not going to raise another lion's progeny. He's not going to do it. That's his wrath. Not only does he kill the male lion who's in charge, but he's going to kill every one of his cubs. Every single one of them. And he's going to start over. That male lion that challenged and won, 
is now going to start that lion's den all over again with his cubs. It's called survival of the fittest, right? If that male lion was not fit enough to defeat a challenger, then the rules of nature are that none of his children deserve to live because they won't be the strongest. This lion's cubs will be the strongest. That's, that's how God designed it. So anyway, a lion which is strongest among beasts and turneth not away for any. Now hold that thought in your mind and turn now to Isaiah 31. And remember now, here we have uh, the king of kings. He's roared as a lion. He's announcing his wrath. Anybody stupid enough to challenge him had better watch out. Oh, so let's let's bring this in. Now, we we touched on this last Sunday. Um, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So just imagine now if you have the devil in charge. Christ is the stronger lion. And he comes down and challenges the devil. Who's going to win? Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's going to destroy all the children of the devil and his offspring will be the ones left. Amen? I like it. Now, Isaiah 31, look at verse 4. For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion, and the young lion roaring on his prey. And look at this. When a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. Look at this. So Read this carefully. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. Doesn't that match exactly what we've seen in Revelation 10? Perfectly. Here we have the Lord coming down. He's roaring like a lion. You got the wicked shepherds of this world with swords and spears and everything else. We got to kill that lion. Kill that lion. And they go out against him and they shout at the lion and they try to get him to cower. But the Bible says he will not abase himself. He's not going to lie down and wait for them to kill him. No, 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 no. He's going full lion mode on them. And he's not going to be afraid of them. He's not going to turn away. And when the Lord comes down to fight for Mount Zion, it will be exactly that way. I think we got us a Savior in Revelation 10. Amen. Now, we already dealt with that. Turn back to Revelation 10. Oh! Saved by the bell. That means you have exactly one week to try to figure out and tell me what the seven thunders are. Let me know because I don't know. Okay? Yes, sir. Boy, you know what? You're, I, that, I think that's a good match. Okay? I think it's part of it. Okay? The number seven is there for a reason. All right? All right, let's go to prayer. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you for roaring like a lion on our behalf. And the evil shepherds of this world have come against us. They don't like us. They hate us. Hate us for what we believe, what we stand for, what we preach. Uh, Lord, I was hated and despised by my own denomination. They didn't like me. They didn't like what I said. They didn't like what I preached. But Father, I believe it came from you. And so I really just didn't have a choice. I had to go with what I believe you were telling me to do, Father. 
And I thank you, Lord, for blessing me. I thank you, Lord, for blessing this church. And Jesus, would you always stand up for your people and protect us like a lion protecting his cubs. Would you be our protector and our savior? Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen, Amen.